since the 1800s, maintaining transportation services and infrastructure has presented an enormous challenge to governments in Newfoundland and Labrador. Part of the problem has been the weather. Ice-choked inshore waters impeded maritime travel for many months of the year. And a persistent freeze-thaw cycle from late fall through early spring wreaks yearly havoc on expensive infrastructure like roads and bridges. Winter snowstorms present other difficulties. So too does population distribution. By the end of the 1800s, about 200,000 people were scattered across 2,000 settlements. Most were small, and most dotted a rugged coastline that sprawls across 17,000 kilometers. Yet another challenge has been Newfoundland and Labrador's terrain. Its many rocks, bogs, ponds, and hills have made railway and road building difficult, expensive, and sometimes even dangerous. Despite these difficulties, the 1800s introduced new and increasingly efficient forms of transportation. New roads and railways linked isolated communities, while government-subsidized steamships transported mail, freight, and passengers. Advances continued into the 20th century with the acceleration of road building and the introduction of a new mode of mass transportation, the airplane. The sea was Newfoundland and Labrador's first highway, and for much of the 1800s, boats and ships were its principal modes of transportation. Most settlements were small, and they were perched right along the coast to take advantage of the fishing grounds. Rocks, bogs, forests, and hills made it difficult to travel across the land, but boats and ships were accessible ways to get around for the largely seafaring population. As the number of coastal communities increased throughout the 1800s, so too did their demand for the regular delivery of food, mail, and other goods from St. John's and elsewhere. At first, privately owned ships filled this gap. They were known as packet boats. Most served communities in Conception Bay, but by the mid-1800s, the government had hired some to work in Trinity, Bonavista, Placentia, and Fortune Bays. Soon, large and efficient steamers began to appear in Newfoundland and Labrador waters. Merchant firms that owned them, like Bowring Brothers and the Reed Newfoundland Company, received government contracts to transport passengers and freight. The coastal boats traveled around the island and along the Labrador coast. At first they turned back at Hopedale, but by the mid-1880s had extended their routes to Nain. Another step forward came in 1898 when the government subsidized the SS Bruce to ferry goods and passengers between Portobasque and Nova Scotia. The Bruce was part of the Reed Newfoundland Company's famous Alphabet Fleet. It numbered eight steamers in the 1890s. Each one was named in alphabetical order after places in Scotland. The Bruce did the Gulf run to Nova Scotia, while the other seven traveled along the Labrador coast and around the island of Newfoundland. Four more vessels were added to the Alphabet fleet in subsequent years. The government took over the fleet in 1923, along with some other coastal steamers it had contracted from other merchant firms. Over time, new steamers joined the fleet including the SS Caribou in 1925. It became the principal ferry on the Gulf Run between Port of Basque and Nova Scotia. In the 1940s, the Commission of Government established the Splinter Fleet. Wooden vessels built at the Clarenville shipyard to serve as freighters in the coastal trade. Each one was named after a local community, including the Clarenville, which is seen here, the Bond Bay, and the Glenwood. The first roads built in Newfoundland and Labrador weren't meant for automobiles, they were meant for carts and carriages. In the 1820s, Governor Sir Thomas Cochrane argued that road construction would bring about three benefits. 
create jobs, help connect coastal communities, and open up previously inaccessible areas to farming and other kinds of development. The first two roads connected Portugal Cove and Topsail to St. John's. Instead of traveling 60 or 95 kilometers by sea, people could now drive 14 kilometers to Portugal Cove or 19 kilometers to Topsail. Packet boats were available at both communities to bring passengers and goods to settlements on the other side of Conception Bay. Many more roads were built in the coming decades, extending well beyond the Avalon Peninsula. Progress was being made, but it was slow and it was difficult. In virtually all cases, the roads constructed were narrow, winding, and hilly, pitted with potholes in summer and impassable in winter. Even so, they served to demonstrate the enormous cost of road building in the Newfoundland terrain. Hardly a mile of construction could be undertaken that did not involve blasting and cutting, filling and bridging, or, alternatively, tortuous winding around bogs and ponds, gullies and ravines, precipitous slopes, and rocky outcroppings. Far fewer roads existed in Labrador than on the island, most were rough trails that became inaccessible during the winter. Dog sleds and snowshoes were the favored modes of land-based transportation during the colder months, while the water was the preferred mode of travel during the spring and summer. Back on the island, the government hired Robert Reed to build and operate a railway. The line revolutionized land-based transportation by providing an overland route across Newfoundland. The first trans-island passenger train left St. John's on June 29, 1898, and arrived at port basque 28 hours later. As more branch lines opened in the coming years, the railway also connected major bays to one another and linked rural villages to larger centers. The government also paid Reed to build and operate an electric streetcar service in downtown St. John's. The first cars began running on May 1, 1900. They were painted bright yellow, had a top speed of 13 kilometers an hour, and a maximum capacity of 50 people. The electric streetcar service ran until September 15, 1948, when it closed. Today, the Metro bus fills a similar service. By the time the streetcars ended service in 1948, change had also come to the Newfoundland Railway. In 1923, the government had assumed control of the line from the Reeds. Operating on a tight budget, it had to close several branch lines in the 1930s. After Confederation with Canada in 1949, the Newfoundland Railway was absorbed into the Canadian National Railway System. Newfoundland's strategic location in the Northwest Atlantic allowed it to play an important role in the development of long-distance flight. On June 14, 1919, British aviators Alcock and Brown took off from Leicester's Field near St. John's to complete the world's first non-stop transatlantic flight. In the coming years, more and more airplanes were used to transport passengers, mail, and goods around the world. In the 1930s, Newfoundland became a western terminus for a commercial transatlantic air service. Airports opened at Botwood and Gander, and regular flights linked North America and Europe by the end of the decade. The Second World War greatly advanced aviation in Newfoundland and Labrador. The Canadian and American armed forces expanded the island's existing airports and built new ones at Argentia, Torbay, Goose Bay, and Stephenville. In 1942, the Canadian and Newfoundland and Labrador governments agreed to establish a commercial air service out of Tor Bay. The first flight took off on May 1st and was operated by Trans-Canada Airlines, which was later renamed Air Canada in 1964. The airline continued to provide daily national and international flights to Torbay, Stephenville, and Gander after the war. 
Botwood ended its commercial seaplane service in 1945 and was later converted into a historic site. In the second half of the 1900s, roads and highways replaced the sea and railway as the dominant form of transportation in Newfoundland and Labrador. Air travel also grew in importance and allowed people to reach faraway places with greater speed than ever before. After Confederation, the federal and provincial governments developed a series of road-building programs to better connect communities across Newfoundland and Labrador with each other and the rest of Canada. Chief among these was the Trans-Canada Highway, which spanned the island and linked it with Nova Scotia by ferry. Work on the Newfoundland portion of the highway ended in 1965. The new route provided a faster and more convenient mode of transportation than the railway, which fell into decline after the 1960s and stopped running altogether in 1988. To compensate, Canadian National Railways introduced a successful line of road cruiser buses in 1968, which could drive across the island in 10 hours. In addition, the provincial and federal governments embarked on a variety of other road-building projects. Paving gravel roads was an ongoing project. Workers also built new roads. Labrador, however, benefited little from the government's road-building programs until the first leg of the Trans-Labrador Highway opened in 1992. The highway is jointly paid for by the provincial and federal governments and runs from the Quebec-Labrador border to the Atlantic coast. After Confederation, the provincial government subsidized local commercial airlines to provide services within the province. Prominent among these was Eastern Provincial Airways, which offered regular flights between Labrador and the island from 1949 until 1987. Over the years, various other airlines have provided regional services, such as Air Borealis and PAL Airlines. Larger airlines like Air Canada and WestJet have provided domestic and international flights. Despite the growing popularity of motor vehicles and air traffic after Confederation, the sea remained an important mode of transportation. The popularity of the Gulf Ferry Service grew to such an extent that a second route was added in 1967 from Argentia to North Sydney. Today, the federal Crown Corporation Marine Atlantic operates the Gulf Ferry Service, while the Newfoundland and Labrador government operates several provincial ferries. At the end of 2021, its fleet included eight provincially owned vessels and seven privately owned contracted vessels. They ferry passengers and cargo to various places around the province, including Belle Island, Fogo Island, Blanc Sablon, and Ramia.